steering. And so what we'd like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is uh, tell a couple stories and hopefully uh, hit a couple of nerves uh, about the importance of steering in delivering lean results. I think we often uh, overemphasize the importance of process, underemphasize the importance of architecture and decision making in coming up with good outcomes. And as part of that, we'll try and differentiate, we'll use the words economic governance as opposed to engineering governance, which is really our way of saying that software and systems today has a lot more uncertainty in it that needs to be dealt with. And the decision making around that uh, doesn't work real well when you use traditional engineering mindsets that are based on laws of physics and laws of materials and precedent experience. So I'd like to tell two stories. The first is uh, a bit of a fairy tale. So once upon a time, uh, you manage an organization who has to put out a new product release in, in 12 months. That's, uh, that's your challenge. You ask your leadership team to estimate this, your architect and your dev, test, project managers get together and decide that it can be done in 11 months. Excellent. Now, how do we optimize our way forward with that information? Well, let's look at how one gentleman would do it. His name is Gerard Hattrick. He's a French Canadian, of course, with a name like that. He loves hockey. And he starts off every project as a traditional project manager would with three goals. Patrick, he needs a very detailed plan for all 12 months, for all 11 months in this case. He needs very precise requirements, and he sets up an early milestone to show early progress. Now, with an extra month of schedule, Jerry is very confident, right? And so he postpones dealing with the bigger uncertainties until later and starts his team off demonstrating the easy things so he can show uh, early progress. And that works out well for a time being. But late in the prog program, typically when integration starts, some dude named Murphy shows up and boom, one of those big uncertainties explodes into a significant project delay. Now, Jerry's conventional project management techniques may be mature, but a more accurate way to describe them might be geriatric. They just don't work for projects of significant uncertainty. Now, let's look at a more savvy project manager. Let's call her Shirley Nimble. Now, Shirley knows that the estimate of 11 months is actually the mean of some more insightful distribution of outcomes that came out of their team estimate of the project resources and schedule. So she asks to see the whole distribution. Right now, she realizes that this proposition is really about a 50-50 bet. A coin flip is not enough for her. She wants to enter the project with a 95% assurance and probability of success. So what can she do? Well, there's essentially three paths. The first thing she can do is ask the business to move out the date, move it out to 15 months, so that this distribution of outcomes has 95% of them showing up within the constraint. Of course, the business says no. The second thing she can do is try and rescope things, make them simpler in some way, so that the estimate moves forward and that still 95% of those outcomes finish before the constraint. And of course, the business says no to this. Why? Because they know exactly what the business needs. Right. So the third thing she can do, and this is where most of our best practices have come from, because what's totally under our control is 
to manage the uncertainties. The problem with this distribution of outcomes is it's too wide. The variance on the distribution is wide because there is uncertainty in what the user really wants. There's uncertainty in what our design and architecture will really perform. There's uncertainty in how the team will perform. So moving forward with this, surely then sets up a sequence of releases that try to reduce uncertainty in two important dimensions. First, the most valuable parts to the user and, and, or risky. And second, the hardest parts, which typically are feasibility issues in the architecture. She sets up a, a first milestone, which is a minimum viable product that enables us to get insight into these uncertainties and to reduce them. And her primary measure of progress is the width of the variance in the estimate to complete. Now, what's the real crux of change from the traditional mindset of geriatric, Jerry Hattrick, and Shirley <laughs> Nimble? Well, Jerry's orient, uh, sorry, engineering orientation drives to a static set of targets. Right, and a deterministic set of predictions. Whereas Shirley Nimble's economic orientation drives to a dynamically changing set of predictions and a more honest assessment of progress and quality. Shirley Nimble is optimizing more like a savvy entrepreneur, a la the techniques of the lean startup. And again, here, architecture and steering are just as much a function of a lean outcome as the process. So this steering leadership we try and call economic governance. Um, validated learning can be measured. I think this is one of the weaknesses of the lean startup book in that objectively looking at validated learning is rather undiscussed. But if you think about it as the variance in the estimate to complete and you're methodical about periodic estimates in which that's a vehicle of communication, you can measure validated learning. And there are ways to reason about this, even though humans are not very good at probabilistic thinking, right? Tools and instrumentation is. And we can capture those complexities within the platform and provide useful information for people to make decisions on. And this will be the topic that Murray will take a look deeper into how this can be done. And hopefully we can all then live happily ever after. Now, let me just tell one other story that comes from the real world that I think does a good job of <coughs> explaining why I think the word requirements is the most misused word in our industry and a remnant of this engineering mindset. So about 25 years ago, working on a, a large command and control system, million lines of new ADA built under mill standard in the most constrained conditions you can imagine, right? We had very serious requirements. One of the requirements was to bring up displays, missile warning displays in one second response time. Okay, and we got to our critical design review a little more than halfway through the program. We had a very iterative, very agile approach well before all this was popular. Very demonstration-based, test-driven development. We had a large portion of the capability executable and put in front of the users at our critical design review. And we were showing our display formats to the users and the stakeholders and the technical monitors. And out of 70 displays, of which we originally did only 30 or so, Right? We had bartered with the user over and over and changed the requirements quite a bit, but we took on that risk. And out of these 70 displays, about six or seven of them took about 1.3 to 1.5 seconds to refresh. So they were out of spec. So we were demonstrating this. The user had been involved with us all along developing this. They were very happy. And as we showed these displays, the MITRE guy, <clears throat> the lead MITRE rep, who was responsible for us delivering on the requirements, that was his job, said, this is great, but you still got, you know, some work to do on the performance of these displays. And we said, yep, you're right. And we know what to do. We've been building them. We've been working with them. We know where performance can be gained and lost. And we need to take out a little of the abstraction we have in our design and architecture. 
And what it means is we're going to have to start freezing these display formats. No more changes, no more diddling around with them. And with that, the user stood up. He now had seen a clear trade-off between this requirement somebody pulled out of the air and a number and what he had been working with for months. And he said, whoa. And he pulled out the spec. And he read it, and it said, these displays shall refresh in one second, O-N-E. And he said, I want to interpret that requirement, since it's only listed with one digit, as one plus or minus 0.5. <laughs> this is our user who negotiated a requirement, the most important requirement, in real time. Way later, the requirements have been baselined for 12 months, 14 months. But there's one instance of proof that requirements is the most misused word in our industry. Everything is negotiable. And why we think an economic view is a much more reasonable way to think about this. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Murray, we'll go into a little deeper, some of the hows we can get to uh, Asian analytics. So I have 10 minutes to do, and it actually takes 14 minutes to do this talk, so I'm in trouble already. No, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through sort of the techniques of how we actually do measure the ongoing distribution of the expected outcomes of the time to complete. And we do this in an instrumented way, and I'm going to explain very quickly how this can be done uh, using modern analytics techniques. And it's, I'm going to, it's going to be a very quick overview. I'm not going to walk through the actual algorithms in any, any kind of depth. We're making these charts available on uh, slideshare.com. So mostly for here, it's just to raise some awareness that these things are possible and there's actually being worked on for now. So uh, people like to learn from stories. And so the story we're gonna talk about here is that a agile team that has been providing a uh, application called Killer App to the US Treasury Department to support their uh, auctions for uh, auctioning off things they've seized, like that Maserati or, or whatever that is, okay? Lots of new business. They really want to get this done on time to meet the business needs, uh, to meet the business market. They know other people are entering into this, and they think there's a great opportunity for the state to enter into uh, the states supporting their auctions as well. So which button do I push? Here we go. So they, uh, this team consists of uh, of two big components. There's the server and the analytics team. There's the GUI and the uh, interface team. And uh, they want to uh, they want to apply agile methods, and they want to get the and they want to plan their work using Scrum and whatever and at the same time hit the target. So this is what we call sort of an enterprise, enter, uh, hybrid enterprise, hybrid agile enterprise kind of process in that they're using all the scrum methods and they're but at the same time they're tracking whether they're actually gonna meet the needs of the business. And if you think about this, this is really very much a lean kind of thing to do because they're working very much within trying to be part of the broader uh, business context and at the same time very closely tracking whether their work and how the work is flowing in a way that they can meet the broader business need and not, and not waste their time on efforts that aren't, that aren't going to do that. So the first thing they need to do is get that initial estimate. And there's a whole bunch of tools for doing that, but, they wanna, but this, is a t this is an estimate the team has to own. Often what happens with those initial estimates where the team gets, they get them from some outside tool, and I won't go into other various techniques for that. And we find the best way to do that is to use the technique we learned from Douglas Hubbard from his book, How to Measure Anything, a wonderful book that you should all know and love, at least I love. And you essentially ask the question when you want to measure anything, well, okay, uh, if some, you ask someone, well, how long is it going to take you to do that piece of work? And he says, I don't know. Says, well, will it take six years? No, it'll take less than that. Well, how about two weeks? No, it'll take more than that. Well, you know something. So let's let's so tell me in the worst case, how long do you think it'll really take? Seriously, I'm really you know tell me. And oh, by the way, in the best case, what do you think? And you get some numbers. 
It says, and based on that, what is your gut feel? And that gives you the three numbers for a triangular distribution. In this case, it says two days, six weeks, and five days. And these are, and we can use these now to start building out our simulations. And what happens when you have this conversation is that you can ask the, you can ask the next question. Well, why is this, so, what, what's the six weeks all about? Well, he says, I don't know. There's something I don't know that I need to learn. I don't know how this technology is going to work. I don't know if my dependencies are going to be met. There's things going on in the future that I can't predict, which I'll know more about later. So for now, I have that amount of uncertainty. Okay, so uh, that's fine. And, you, and that gives you some clue as to where maybe as the manager, you can even help by helping invest in resolving the uncertainty. So suddenly, rather than out holding a person responsible for an estimate, you now you're collaborating on what that estimate means, where the sources of uncertainty are, which leads to the variances. So you get this for the various tasks. Now you can start building the... What did I do? No, it's not. Help. I'll talk while you, I'll talk while you help. Okay. So what you can do now and what the technique of the thing is, is that the, the analytics, it runs a simulation of how the team might execute by taking the de past dependencies between the various tasks that have been defined. And what you discover when you're doing this kind of creative work is that there's no single critical path. There's a set of possible paths through the project execution depending on when the team does finish the work, when a project finishes the work, when the staff would become available for the next thing. And what we do is we do run a whole bunch of different simulations of all the possible ways these tasks could be executed in the order that they might be executed. And we see how long each of those take. This is essentially, this is, this, the, the name for doing this is called Monte Carlo simulation. Now, hopefully I won't push the wrong button this time. I push the up button. Okay. So let me just jump ahead to where we are. So there's a bunch of different possible schedules of when these tasks might, might, might finish because maybe that work will finish in the one day, maybe it'll finish in the, in, the, in the best case, maybe it'll finish in the worst case, maybe it'll finish in the exact, exact same case. Each of those possible things might happen with certain probability. And that means that there's various different way of paths through the, through the project, each of which needs to be modeled and executed. And with that, we can comply that all together from the task dependencies, the applied orderings node. And then what we get is a range of out possible outcomes, each of which their probability of how the projects might be executed. And again, uh, and what, it, what you get from that is a probability distribution, and in this case, it's showing that there's a 38% poss possibility with those initial estimates that you're going to finish on the time that you say you're going to. Okay? Now, given that the project, is that a good bet or not? Well, it, it, actually, it's not such a bad thing because what the project manager can do is now shape that distribution over time by making good decisions interacting with the team because they, because they can sort of look at where those variances, what, what are the sources of those variances, working to reduce them, and do things like maybe uh, de-scope those things which aren't really necessary, which are adding to the uncertainty. So moving forward, now the, the, the server team is, so they, they go ahead with that bet, but the, now we're a month into the project. Now what do we do? Now we know more than we knew a month ago because we know how the team is actually performing. We know which of those things have actually gotten done. And we have an idea of the, the, the distribution of the, action, of the execution times of the 
those those uh, bigger tasks that have been broken down into finer work items that have now, and we have now a, a distribution of the actual time it took to complete those work items as we apply the agile methods. So we, we apply the data mining techniques to that to get the various things. Now, we, now what we do is we apply machine learning techniques where we learn from the, agile, from the actuals. So we started out with people's, people's guesses of how long it would take. Now we have actual data how long it did take to do the work. And we can take that into account to, as, as Walker pointed out, using Bayesian reasoning to go from the prior estimates to the posterior estimates. And here are four techniques for doing that. And we're exploring, we're actually explore, explore, uh, exploring all of them. Now these are not new ideas in the world. We'll do it in two minutes, I promise. These are not new ideas in the world. The idea of applying Monte Carlo simulation to the possible range of outcomes is not a new idea with us. It's been around for a while. It's a little bit different here than you may see in other tools is because what we're applying it to is the, uh, is, not, is not necessarily to find the critical path analysis, but to sort of look at the uh, possible interactions of, of the team members. So it's a slightly novel thing, but it's not very novel. The, the idea of applying these machine learning techniques to the actual project execution in place, well, that's somewhat new again, but these, these techniques are not at all new. They've been around for decades, frankly. And if you take a course in machine learning, you, these are the kind of techniques you'll learn. So, There's some lessons from, so with this, they were able to identify, one, they get more certain about their predictability because they know how their team is actually executing. There are things they can do. They can actually negotiate the scope as Walker was talking about. They can add new kinds of, they can, under, they can look at which tasks are adding to the uncertainty of the delivery, and they can add new skills, and, and while avoiding the the phenomenon of Brooks Law with making adding light people to a project and make it later rather than, than better. If you add the right skills, they're focused on the right on the right set of tasks, you can actually improve the outcome. You can um, and if you need to you can renegotiate the the the, uh, the the time. So wrapping up, these are techniques which we're really trying to, which we are implementing. These things are, we have, uh, we're working now doing initial pilots with customers. We're validating this with on uh, real project data. So what Walker showed you was sort of the concepts of how to do this. The good news here is that it turns out that all the algorithms that we've tried so far have turned out to be uh, good enough to actually make a difference in helping people drive to good behaviors. And uh, with, in this day of big data and and of uh, more agile techniques, we have the analytics and the mathematical techniques where we can start thinking about applying these sort of lean methods to these more uncertain efforts. Thank you.